Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. In this chapter, we will try to recapitalize what we saw before and introduce some new concepts. You may never have studied economics before and yet when you open a newspaper, what do you read? A report from our economics correspondent. Turn on the TV news and what do you see? An item on the state of the economy. Talk to your friends. Often, and often the topic will turn to the price of this or that product or whether you have got enough money to afford to do this or that. The fact is that economics affects our daily lives. We are continually being made aware of local, national and international economic issues. Whether price increases, interest rate changes, fluctuations in exchange rates, unemployment, economic recessions or the effects of globalization. We are also continually faced with economic problems and decisions of our own. What should I buy for supper? Should I save up for a summer holiday or spend more on day-to-day -day living? Should I go to university or should I try to find a job now? And if I go to university, should I work part-time? So just what is economics about? In the last chapter, we attempted to answer this question and gave you some insights into the subject that you will be studying. We saw how the subject is divided up and in particular we distinguished between the two major branches of economics, microeconomics and macroeconomics. We also looked at the ways in which different types of economy operate from the centrally planned economies of the former communist countries to the largely free market economies of most of the world today. Now, let's try to give a brief definition of the main key concepts we saw before. And let's get started with production. Production is the transformation of inputs into outputs by firms in order to earn profit or to meet some other objective. The conception is the fact of using goods and services to satisfy wants. This will normally involve purchasing the goods and services. As for the factors of production or resources, they represent the inputs into the production of goods and services and they are labor, land and raw materials and capital. We focused also on labor, which represents all forms of human input, both physical and mental, into current production. Land and raw materials are inputs into production that are provided by nature, for example, unimproved land and mineral deposits in the ground. Capital represents all inputs into production that have themselves been produced, for example, factories, machines and tools. We also talked about scarcity, which is the excess of human wants over what can actually be produced to fulfill these wants. Then we talked about macroeconomics, which is the branch of economics that studies economic aggregates in terms of gain totals, for example, the, the overall level of prices, the output and employment in the economy. We saw that aggregate demand is the total level of spending in the economy and that the aggregate supplies is the total amount of output in the economy. As for microeconomics, it is the branch of economies that studies individual units. For example, households, firms and industries it studies the interrelationships between these units in determining the pattern of production and distribution of goods and services. We also talked briefly about a main and important concept called 
the market. In fact, the market is the interaction between buyers and sellers. It is as simple as that. When we talked about the different economic systems, we talked about the centrally planned or, in other words, command economy, which is an economy where all economic decisions are taken by the central authorities. As for the free market economy, it is an economy where all economic decisions are taken by individual households and firms and with no government intervention. Finally, we saw the mixed economy, which is an economy where economic decisions are made partly by the government and partly through the market. In practice, all economies are mixed. We also saw the informal sector, which is the part of the economy that involves production and or exchange. There are no money payments. We also talked about the subsistence production where uh, people produce things for their own consumption. We talked also about input-output analysis and this involves dividing the economy into sectors where each sector is a user of inputs from and a supplier of outputs to the other sectors. The technique examines how these inputs and outputs can be matched to the total resources available in the economy. As for the price mechanism, it is the system in a market economy whereby changes in price in response to changes in demand and supply have the effect of making demand equal to supply. The equilibrium price, the price where the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied, it is the price where there is no shortage or surplus. As for the equilibrium, it's a position of balance, a position from which there is no inherent tendency to move away. Finally, we talked about the mixed market economy, which is a market economy where there is some government intervention. Eventually, the relative price is the price of one good compared with another. For example, good X is twice the price of good Y. We also talked about economic models. When we talked about the nature of economic reasoning, we said that economic model is a formal presentation of an economic theory. As for induction, it is the constructing general theories on the basis of specific observations. Deduction is the using of theory to draw conclusions about specific circumstances. And we presented the ceteris paribus Latin for saying other things being equal. This assumption has to be made when making deductions from theories. And finally, we made the difference between positive statement and normative statement. We said that positive statement is a value-free statement which can be tested by an appeal to the facts. As for normative statement, it is a value judgment. Now, I want to introduce a new and very important concept called the opportunity cost. It is the cost of any activity measured in terms of the best alternative for gone. In fact, the opportunity cost of any activity is the sacrifice made to do it. It is the best thing that could have been done as an alternative. Scarcity, as we have seen, is at the heart of economics. We face scarcity as individuals. Each of us has a limited income and hence we cannot buy everything we want. Also, there are only 24 hours in a day and we all have a limited lifespan. So even if we had the money, we would not be able to enjoy every possible good we would like to consume or take part in every possible activity. The same applies to nations. 
a country has limited resources and so cannot produce everything people would like. Of course, this is also true on a global scale. Our planet has finite resources and the technology and our abilities to exploit these resources are also limited. We thus have to make choices. In fact, virtually every time we do something, we are making a choice between alternatives. If you choose to spend your time staying in and watching television, you are choosing not to go out. And if you buy a DVD for 10 euros, you are choosing not to spend that 10 euros on something else. Likewise, if a country devotes more of its resources to producing manufactured goods, there will be less to devote to the provision of services or the production of agricultural goods. If we devote more resources to producing a cleaner environment, we may have to produce less of the material goods that people want to consume. What we give up in order to do something is known as its opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the cost of doing something measured in terms of the best alternative for a gun. It's what you would have chosen to do with your money or time if you had not made the choice you did. This is one of the most fundamental concepts in economics. It affects the way you look at economic problems. When you use the concept of opportunity cost, you are thinking like an economist. And this may be different from thinking like an accountant or from the way you thought before. We will come across this concept many times throughout this course. By looking at opportunity cost, we are recognizing that we face trade-offs. To do more of one thing involves doing less of something else. For example, we trade off work and leisure. The more we work, the less leisure time we will have. In other words, the opportunity cost of working is the leisure we have sacrificed. Nations trade off producing one good against others. The more a country spends on defense, whether on weapons or employing military personnel, the less it will have to spend on consumer goods and services. This has become known as the guns versus butter. Trade-off. In other words, if a country decides to use more of its resources for defense, the opportunity cost is the consumer goods sacrificed. We thus have to make decisions between alternatives. To make sensible decisions, we must weigh up the benefits of doing something against its opportunity cost. This is known in economics as rational decision making. Now, let's talk about scarcity and abundance. Indeed. The central economic problem, as we already said, is scarcity. But are all goods and services scarce? Is anything we desire truly abundant? First, what do we mean by abundance? In the economic sense, we mean something where supply exceeds demand at a zero price. In other words, even if it is free, there is no shortage. What is more, there must be no opportunity cost in supplying it. For example, if the government supplies health care free for, to the sick, it is still scarce in the economic sense because there is a cost to the government and hence the taxpayer. Two things that might seem to be abundant are air and water. So let's discuss these examples. Air. In one sense, air is abundant. There is no shortage of air to breathe for most people for most of the time. But if we define air as clean, unpolluted air, then in some parts of the world it is scarce. In these cases, resources have to be used to make clean air available. If there is pollution in cities or near industrial plants, it will cost money to clean it up. We may not pay directly the cleaned up air, may be free to the consumer 
but the taxpayer or industry and hence its customers will have to pay, even if you live in a non-polluted part of the economy. You, will, you may well have spent money moving there to escape the pollution. Again, there is an opportunity cost to obtain the clean air. As for water, whether water is abundant depends again on where you live. It also depends on what the water is used for. Water for growing crops in a country with plentiful rain is abundant. In drier countries, resources have to be sent on irrigation. Water for drinking is not abundant. Reservoirs have to be built. The water has to be piped, purified and plumped. Here I will give you two questions and let you try to imagine the solutions by yourself. First question. There is a saying in economics. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Hence, the subtitle for this paragraph. What does this mean? Two, are any other desirable goods or services truly abundant? Now, I want to talk about Adam Smith and the invisible hand of the market. Many economists would argue the modern economics dates from 1776, the year in which Adam Smith's An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations was published, one of the most important books on economics ever written. The work in five books is very wide-ranging, but the central argument is that market economies generally serve the public interest well. Markets guide production and consumption like an invisible hand, even though everyone is looking after their own private self-interest, their interaction in the market will lead to the social good. In Book 1, Chapter 2, Smith writes, Man has almost constant occasion for the help of this brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Later, in Book 4, Chapter 2, he continues. Every individual is continually exerting himself to find out the most advantageous employment of whatever capital he can command. It is his own advantage indeed, and not that of the society, which he has in view, but the study of his own advantage, naturally or rather necessarily, leads him to prefer that employment which is most advantageous to the society. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worst for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. He argued, therefore, with one or two exceptions, that the state should not interfere with the functioning of the economy. It should adopt a laissez-faire or hands-off policy. It should allow free enterprise for firms and free trade between countries. The praise of the free market has led many of the political right to regard him as the father of the libertarian movement, the movement that advocates the absolute minimum amount of state intervention in the economy. In fact, one of the most famous of the libertarian societies is called the Adam Smith Institute. But Smith was not blind to the drawbacks of unregulated markets. 
That's why in book one, chapter seven, he looks at the problem of monopoly. A monopoly granted either to an individual or to a trading company has the same effect as a secret in trade or manufacturers. The monopolists, by keeping the market constantly understocked by never fully supplying the effectual demand, sell their commodities much above the natural price and raise their emoluments, whether they consist in wages or profit, greatly above their natural rate. Later on, he looks on at the dangers of firms getting together to pursue their mutual interest. People on the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment or diversion, but the controversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So this is the end of part one. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your attention.